Okay, so I can see that we already have some attendees who are here. For those of you who are early, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes, and so we're going to uh, wait until our official start time, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. In the meantime, uh, if you, you know, want to get yourself a drink, get something <laughs> to settle down with, that will, uh, I think, be helpful. Uh, if you haven't already, feel free to visit the um, Ohana Center of Excellence uh, webpage at aanhpi-ohana.org. Um, feel free to look at some of our other uh, webinars and things that we have done in the past. Okay, um, it's a little after uh, 2 p.m. right now. We're going to go ahead and give it a couple more minutes, though. Uh, it seems like there's a, a few attendees who are still trying to log on, so we'll give a couple of minutes for people to um, get logged on. Um, I, I assume there are going to be people who are joining in um, between meetings, and so we'll give uh, just a couple more minutes to get started so that way people can transition in um, and settle and get, get settled. Okay, 
I was told not to keep the people waiting. So for those of you who are here uh, inside the Zoom space already joining us, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Dr. Lester Papa. I am a um, I am a program specialist and a regional steering committee facilitator for the Ohana Center of Excellence. I am joined today um, by two uh, uh, excellent speakers who I will introduce in just a second. Um, this is part of our ongoing um, web series to look at the intersection of LGBTQIA plus identity and also uh, AA and HPI identity. So we're taking an intersectionalist approach to uh, taking a look at these experiences as it impacts mental health and substance use. Um, for today, our specific focus is going to be on Afakasi experience. And so we have two Afakasi joining us today, Stanson Afua and uh, Leo, Leole Masina, who um, Lubanski, who uh, so uh, graciously uh, took the time to be able to join us. Um, a little bit about our speakers. So Stanson is a content creator on TikTok, where he's curated a following of over 117,000 people. He utilizes his background in communication studies to form his content and has been able to use uh, his platform to connect and create cultural conversations that have gained traction in the diaspora in the islands of Samoa and across Oceania. Leole Masina um, is... Um, was born in Southern California and raised in Arizona, where they still live. They've always wanted to know more about um, Fa'a Samoa, um, specifically, especially what life was like before colonization. This led them to majoring in Asian and Pacific uh, American Studies at Arizona State University, where they were the first to graduate with that degree in 2014. Um, Leo is transbinary, culturally, Fatama, queer, ADHD, and autistic, and has always advocated for underrepresented, pe underrepresented people like them. They're an alumnus of the sixth cohort of Pacific Islander Leaders for Tomorrow pilot through Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, EPIC, and uh, was asked to return as Mana Mentor for the 10th cohort. Currently, they serve as community organizer for uh, Arizona Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders for equity, and as board member and secretary for Island Liaison. So you're going to be hearing a lot more from each of our speakers. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and provide a, a shout out to um, the, the series itself. And so if you haven't uh, already seen um, the first installment of this web series, please go ahead and um, after this presentation, not right now, <laughs> but after this presentation is over, go ahead and head over to the um, Center of Excellence website at aanhpi-ohana.org. You can go ahead under replays, uh, find our first um, episode of the web series, and then uh, be able to catch up on that dialogue as well. See where the, the dialogue came from. All right. I think I've stalled enough. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to our speaker, Stanson and uh, Leole Masina, whoever would like to go first. If you could just uh, go ahead and just provide um, a little bit more about your yourself and your social locations, and then we can go ahead and get started with our dialogue. I can go ahead and start. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stanton Afoa. Uh, I am a very proud Samoan. I am also a very proud gay man. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and, and Samoan Oya. Uh, and yes, like I said, I'm here in Anchorage, Alaska, and you can find me on TikTok and Instagram. Salo palava, everybody. My name is Leola Masino Pele Lubansky. My pronouns are they, them in English, and Oya and Samoan. And I'm located on Otam land in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'm Samoan, Polish, and Czech, and I'm also proudly queer and trans. Okay, 
Hey, so excited to get started in this conversation. So excited, in fact, that I uh, almost did not remember to provide a, an acknowledgement of uh, the spaces in which we are going to have this conversation. So I really wanted to quickly recognize that I am broadcasting out here in San Jose, California, the land of the um, Muakma Olomi peoples and our um, I'm recognizing that uh, we are having this conversation on a, a land that is uh, been colonized and has a history of colonization. I also want to acknowledge that this history is not unique to San Jose, California, and that is also a tradition that is also in Alaska and Arizona, where our speakers are from. And so I wanted to acknowledge um, the indigenous peoples of each of those states and the resilience of uh, the people who uh, do exist and are well and alive today. So first things first, I went ahead and wanted to focus on the Afakasi experience. Let's talk about it. Afakasi, as a term, what does that mean and what does that mean to you? Leo, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, so for me, uh, Afkasi, my mom told me uh, that Afkasi means half of one, Afa being half and Kasi or Tasi being one in Samoan. So I see it as being like the literal translation being half of a Samoan. Um, but for me personally, I really see it as having that cultural pride. Like I could just say I'm half Samoan to somebody. But when I say Afakasi, it's like a signal to other Pacific Islanders, especially Samoans, that I mixed and things might be a little different with me, but then I'm still Samoan. Uh, I love that. I, I align with Liole Masina. Uh, so interestingly enough, um, I also grew up with the understanding that uh, Afakasi meant um, half of one. And then there's also this other translation that comes about um, with Afkasi being a transliteration of half casted. And if you say like, half casted, Afkasi, 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 you can kind of hear it. So you'll oftentimes hear both of those translations. Um, but Leo's correct. It just um, it it signifies that someone is half Samoan. Um, and it's something that definitely does align with me. I'm very proud of my heritage. Um, and I for me, it's always been like this neutral term of like, yeah, I'm Afkasi but very proud of being so. Okay. So, you know, thank you for uh, orienting us to the term afakasi. Um, interesting though, that it is like referring to being half of something, right? In this case, being half someone. Uh, and so, you know, along with that kind of half term, I can imagine that it would be a term that could maybe be perceived as something that is like derogatory or something to be ashamed of because you're not full someone you're not like real someone right <laughs> that you are only half um and so i i'm wondering if you do could share a little bit more about that experience of uh, um afakasi and uh, you know did that bring things like shame or was that really like it seems like for the two of you there's also a bit of pride of empowerment too yeah i can i can go first um no, that, that's a really interesting topic because um, you will find, I, I personally believe that being Afakasi, it's a it's a heavily criticized group within our community. Um, I think growing up, you hear a lot of, oh, sh he's just Afakasi, you know, like, oh, he doesn't know, he's not, um, le, o se, Samo Moni. He's, not, he's not a true Samoan, he's only half. Um, and so you hear it used a lot that way. And then on the other side of things, you'll hear, people being like, oh, he thinks he's better because he's Afkasi, um, which I always found really interesting because I never thought that about myself, but you, I've heard this um, said numerous times throughout my life. Uh, what are your thoughts, Leo? Yeah, um, I, I do agree that there's like kind of that either people are like, oh, they don't know anything because they're Afkasi or like thinking like, they're better. Um, I think it also, there is like different shades to it. Like I, like me and you can't really speak to this experience necessarily, but um, wanting to like uplift that. It also depends on what you're mixed with too. Um, like, you know, like I said earlier, I'm like white in Samoa. And so in a way, like when I went back home to Samoa um, as an adult, I, I feel like a lot of my family back home kind of like 
had this conception of me as like American and also like with my dad being white just like there's a different mentality there but for me personally I feel like I've been actually moving away from using the term afakasi to describe myself um, because it feels like by saying that I'm half Samoan that I'm trying to justify my experience even though I'm like an entire person so I've felt like these sort of like imp- inferiority complex of like not knowing enough because I'm afakasi or because my mom didn't teach me the stuff growing up but it's it's a hard line to balance, I think, because you want to show respect because, you know, if you're not raised with it, but at the same time, like, I've always been really passionate about knowing more, like, even more so than some of my cousins who aren't Afghasi who are, like, full Samoan, so it's hard either way. <laughs> Thank you, too. Um, so, yeah, it seems like <laughs> there is a delicate balance, like, I, I think for both of you, I saw this hand motion, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> navigating between two worlds um, that, that comes with the territory, right? Of uh, being a Fakasian, you know, like the the being half someone and, um, you know, to, to your point, like not necessarily getting recognized as the whole. Um, I'm curious then, you know, if uh, that experience has intersected uh, any way with uh, things like mental health and or substance use, because, right, like, it's a pretty stressful place to be in to have to navigate. And, you know, if you have uh, uh, family members who are Samoan and then family members who are uh, white, they don't necessarily know their experience, right? And so, yeah, speak a little bit more uh, uh, to that. Uh, to like uh, the, the effects of um, of being Afghasi on mental health and, okay, yeah. Um, I, th- I think it's interesting because I was thinking about this um, you know, I have always been gay. I've known since, you know, I, you know my, my pampered days, right? You know, since I was in diapers, I've known since I was a kid, um, even if I didn't come out until later on, I've always been gay and I've always been half Samoan. For me, it's kind of hard to separate those two. So sometimes I'm not exactly sure, like, oh, did these mental health issues arise from one or the other? Or was it a combination of both? I think um externally they may look like two separate issues but for internally they've always been um intertwined and you know that's that's living at the inter- intersection of this identity right um but i do remember um feeling a lot of isolation and sadness um for for being off uh growing up uh kids in general are bu- are bullies you know <laughs> it's just, it, you know it, it is you know what it is uh but man someone kids can be mean <laughs> <laughs> and, and so sometimes when you are on the receiving end of that, um, especially as a kid who's very insecure in your identity, uh, it can hit hard. It can hit very hard. Um, so I, I do remember struggling a lot with that. And it wasn't until much later on um, when I started taking real ownership of everything that I was um, that I started to overcome that. Yeah, um, I really resonate with what you said about like feeling isolated um I remember growing up like the phrase in my head was definitely like not blank enough like I was not mourn enough not like like well almost like too white for someone's faces um like not and then for like all the other intersections kind of like you were saying like I felt like I wasn't like I knew I was um a trans when I was really young I just thought it was like me being a tomboy and like wanting to wear my brother's clothes for some reason and like (laughs) and it was like I'd grow out of it or something because my mom told me um but then in terms of mental health there was a lot of like compartmentalizing all those different identities down um like I remember one time in junior high school where we were like taking like a scantron test we had to bubble in the answers and at the top under my name like they said you could only bubble in one race. And I was like having an identity crisis in my seat, trying to figure out whether I should pick Pacific Islander or white. And I was thinking like, I don't look like my like white blonde friends, but at this point in my life being 13, I don't know anything about like being Pacific Islander, being Samoan, cause my mom didn't teach us that cause she didn't want to alienate my brother and I, which is understandable. So I was just like, what do I pick? I don't know. And like at that moment, I picked Pacific Islander, but I feel like that's where it gave me a lot of permission 
during that time being young to like ask my mom about those things, which helped. And it led me to what I'm doing now. But at the same time, there was a lot of loneliness and like, she wouldn't let us go to like the, the only like Samoan church here in Arizona with my cousins um, and things like that. So I felt ostracized from the community. And yet I just really wanted to know more constantly, which like led me down a lot of really interesting paths. So it's, yeah, there was a lot of like balance and trying to self-reflect and um, be respectful too, like I was saying earlier. For sure, totally understandable. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that uh, we focus and make sure we highlight like, like, right, navigating is not always easy and stands into your point, yes, kids are brutal, right? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, are really mean to each other as well. And so, you know, with the, the challenges, right, the um the challenges, the barriers, the things that uh, make it hard to be able to kind of navigate through. Where were some, uh, where or who were some um, people or places where you would, could look to for support when you had trouble navigating? That is an excellent question, Lester. <laughs> um, I think, I think um, you know, growing up, I'm, I'm a millennial, I was born in 94. So this was, you know, growing up in the 2000s, 2010s, I don't think there was a ton of resources. Mental health wasn't something that was very prominent in the way that it is today. I think um, oftentimes I looked, not only a lot of, I looked for comfort in other Afkasi. Um, it was that sense of community. Um, it was almost like this unspoken bond. Like, and even when we did talk about it, it was like, you're preaching right now. Everything that you're saying just resonates uh, wholeheartedly. Um, so is that, but even just other mixed people in general, I feel like that it was um, just such a huge source of comfort. Um, and then of course, there, like I, I want to give huge props to you. Know, there are plenty of Samoans who are so accepting and loving and understanding of the identity of being half Samoan um, that they gave me a lot of comfort too. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, so I would say it was a lot of community-based support. Uh, that I was um, gravitating towards at that time. Our experiences are so similar. Like, it, it's wild to think that, like, you and I were, like, going through these really similar things. You're in Alaska and I'm in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yes, a, a very, very, like, similar and relatable for me, too. Um, I definitely, like, have... I remember being on Tumblr back in, in college days and, like... <laughs> That's where a lot of my really solid afakasi, and then we found out later we're all neurodivergent, queer, trans, like we started off finding each other through the afakasi um, experience. And then like together and like talking together, we realized other things like being queer, being like trans and neurodivergent and all those other things. So it was a lot of online. Um, yeah. And then for me personally, my uncle, um who moved here when I was in college like I was trying to learn like a dance or something for like a cultural fest out here and I remember getting really frustrated because I felt like I couldn't do it because I wasn't I didn't grow up doing it in the church all the time so I was telling him about it and he was like your blood is the same blood as your family back in the village in Samoa so like whether or not you feel like you can do it to whatever like standard you have in your head like it is your birthright and you're allowed to do it like even if, if you have to do it differently so definitely just like Stanton said like even within like our families and Samoan community there's a lot of Samoans that are very like supportive of the experience and want to understand it and like help bolster us in learning um, my uncle was also really influ influential on that and like teaching me the things I wanted to know. Thank you, Leo. Man, I felt that. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I think like, you know, having like someone to be able to say, no, you can claim this, like this is yours. Um, in that way is super, super powerful. Now, as an LGBT person myself, Okay. Um, and also being a fellow person of color, um, sometimes being in the LGBT community and the LGBT spaces, while at times, right, 
definitely fabulous, empowering, <laughs> right? Can full of pride. <laughs> Also, there's there's like a very specific kind of experience, right, of being a person of color in these spaces. And so I am curious if you two can speak to experiences where, and you know, you've hinted at this a little bit already, where maybe, you know, in the right rainbow family space, you're a little too brown for that. But when you are in your Samoan spaces, maybe you're a little bit too rainbow to be there too. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I'm just curious of if, if there had been uh, any experiences like that that you could share, share or speak to. Um, Leo, do you want to go first this time? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. So I feel like me being um, Fatama, like you mentioned, that's part of my bio. Um, even like being Fatama or like trans masculine, I guess you could translate it as, um, there's not even like, uh, like Fatama are very invisibilized in the Samoan community, like Fopafine or like trans women, trans femmes are a lot more visible than Fatama. And even within the Fatama community, I've heard people say Fatama, Fafatama, like there's not even like a deciding what it is <laughs> or like how to say it. Um, and so it it feels very again like the isolating feeling of being like marginalized within a marginalized community and another marginalized community, um, but at the same time, um, I feel like there's room to grow in that identity because there isn't too much known about it, um, which is exciting. But it it is frustrating to have to. I've made my peace with the fact that a lot of Samoan people like my family will see me as a woman. And I made my peace with like, I'd rather them see me as a woman than not see me at all. Um, so that's where I'm at in that part of the journey. That's so real. Um, I just want to second what you said about Fafatama, kind of not having the visibility that um, of Fafafine do. Um, for me, within the Samoan community, um, I think one of the most difficult lines for me to navigate is that I'm, I use the term masculine very loosely here, but I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a masculine uh, gay man. So oftentimes people are like, are you, are you Fafafine? Because um, in Samoan, it's a, it's a very conceptual language, right? Like we have umbrella terms that kind of mean the same thing. So uh, Fafafine is what we use for both gay men and trans women, essentially. It's just people who fall, it's just the literal translation is the way of a woman. Um, so it's just the concept of it. Um, so I think sometimes that was really difficult and for me to navigate, not so much anymore. Um, I feel very comfortable in who I am in my community. Um, and I do kind of get extra feminine when I'm in my community. <laughs> Um, and that's because I believe wholeheartedly that my community is a loving one. I just think that it's, um, I'm at an age now where people have had the time to learn. Uh, so, you know, that differentiates from, you know, maybe even five years ago. Now, when it comes to um, spaces here in the States that are predominantly white, it's not a space that I find myself in often anymore, by choice, by choice. Um, it's so interesting, like you, like, I'll tell people, like, yeah, I've been called exotic. I can't tell you how many times. And it's, I'm not, I'm not a fruit with spikes on it. Like, I don't, I'm not over here orange and purple. I don't know what you mean by exotic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that. I just, um, it's a lot of being sexualized. I feel like that's a big one that I've um, gotten. Or just, like, dirty, grimy looks. Um, and I will say the gay community in general across the globe can be very catty, but I think when you've been through it enough, you can tell the difference of like where that where that look is coming from, <laughs> you know. Um, so I do I do mostly find myself in brown and black spaces, um, and like I said, that's uh, that's intention behind it. Yeah, I I, I feel that wholeheartedly, <laughs> um, and so yeah, I, I think that um, you know one of the things that I, I tend to wonder about also right, is, you know, being within the uh, LGBTQ plus um, 
spectrum, right? And uh, there are so many uh, different types of intersections. Some of them, you know, minoritize, some of them not. Um, I'm curious though, because one of the things that often gets uh, highlighted, right? Uh, specifically where the uh, LGBT um, population is like the increased risk of, right? Mental health and specifically substance use, right? There's a lot of partying, <laughs> for example, that gets involved with or associated with the LGBT community. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious um, if you uh, have uh, um, any thoughts about, um, you know, people thinking, or, you know, right, like once you say like you're gay, that they automatically think like gay club, gay like um, pride, right? Gay, like all the things that are all parties and uh, use of substances and that kind of thing within the communities. You know, if you two could speak to um, any like experiences to that point. Go ahead, Leo. Well, actually, I was going to say you can take this one because <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I like grew up like really like sheltered and straight edge. And then like I turned 21 in Samoa and went to a club in Samoa. And it was like, there was like a live band playing and there was like a bunch of old guys there. So it wasn't really much of an experience for me. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not really like, I'm not like a, the part of your type. So I feel like I don't have anything to say on this one. <laughs> so just drag me. You're like, Stanson, this is all you. <laughs> um, I am a partier. Um, I've calmed down a lot, but um, I do, um, I do see the prevalence of substance abuse. Uh, within the queer community, um, it's very normalized. Um, I, you know, for a long time, I partook in it too. Um, and I think initially, it, you know, it, for me, it was, I think it was twofold uh, why I was using it. One, uh, because it was fun. You know, drugs are fun until they're not, until they're destructive and until, you know, you can't remember what happened the last two days. But it was also an escape. I think that's, you know, why, um, clubbing is very prevalent too in the gay community is because it acts as that escape. And so when you throw drugs in the mix as well, you just, you know, you're, you, you are way away from all of your issues and your problems that are happening. Uh, so I, yeah, I definitely, I definitely seen it uh, just be a huge thing. And even, you know, I've, I've been um, clean from drugs for a, a, quite some time now, but I just, I still have friends who, who use it, I think just because it's become habitual. Uh, for, for a long extent, a long time. For sure. Uh, and I think, you know, you, that really like resonates with me also, I think like as somebody who has, you know, uh, come out um, somewhat later in life, um, it's 2023 now, so I've been out about 10 years, right? Um, but I, uh, I, I think I remember, you know, then like my my welcome to the rainbow community had been with uh, a vodka in one hand. You know? <laughs> it, it feels very much like you need to kind of take on this like um, drinking, partying kind of thing to be able to fit in with the community, right? Because everybody else is doing it. And so you don't want to be like the outlier. You don't necessarily want to stick out and kind of be like, uh, you know, not with, like, not for the community, if you're not doing the community things, but to your point, Stance, and it becomes like the cycle, right, of like, well, you're using it on one hand to cope, and then it's also then now becoming cultural, right, <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it, it, it ha it's really hard um, to then try to, um, you know, fit in, like, you know, being queer is not just partying, though, like, we also, like, right, can be reliable partners. We can also be like good people. Like it is not just uh, us out here just wanting to party and have fun. Like we can also contribute things to society, right? So, no, I think that's huge. I um, it's so interesting that we talk about this because I've been seeing like I think for like the past year on TikTok, I've been seeing so many videos talking about like people's first time at the gig club and like they get their first drink and it's. 98% liquor and then like a splash of water. Um, and we're all like, ha ha, that's so true. And then if you take a second and think about it, you're like, that's not good. <laughs> that's, it's, you know, it's definitely a think piece. 
And that's the thing, like it's also developmental, right? Like, like when you get first introduced, like I said, you get introduced with vodka in your hand. And after that, like when you've been in the community long enough, you're like, well, maybe, maybe, you know, like yeah. I can do things that are like also uh, very affirming for my queerness that are outside of the club, right? Maybe we can like have queer affirming hikes also. <laughs> <laughs> Queer affirming like book clubs. Yes. <laughs> that, that can also be uh equally as empowering. Um yeah, I feel like that was my sort of like, <laughs> like that was the other side of it for me is like I felt like I was missing out because I was I was I, like I wasn't going out with everybody else. And I also like realized I was and I and I came out later in life. Um but yeah, it is it, like hearing you both talk about it. I'm like, yeah, that's everything that I like was told to do by other people, but just like never felt comfortable enough to do. Um, so yeah, it's like the weird like other side of the coin. And like I was the one taking care of like the people that came home like blacked out kind of thing. <laughs> right. Oh, and you know the then um, making sure we're, we're we're good in time. And I think we are. I think I really want to pull in the fact too that right context really matter. Uh, and so for both of you, um, you know, you are in states that are, you know, I think I can fairly say pretty conservative, right? <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I uh, had gotten my PhD um, in Utah. And so I uh, had, uh, you know, been you know, been trained to be a mental health provider in a pretty conservative um, state and uh, you know when uh, the uh, values of the state tend to lean toward being um, conservative and uh, um, right homophobic <laughs> um, homophobic uh, also racist and uh, you know when you are at, in that intersection political political climate also is a contributing factor um so i'm wondering if you all have um thoughts about that about how you know um context outside of just right rainbow and someone spaces uh also can contribute to um impacts for substance use and also mental health i can speak like being in alaska we have very high rates of of mental health issues and substance abuse. Um, a lot of this has to do with the geography of things. Um, you know, when you're in the lower 48, uh, is what we, like the, the mainlander, <laughs> um, you know, everything is so close to one another. You can drive three hours and be in a different state. Uh, here you drive three hours, you're three, outside, three, three hours outside of the city in the middle of nature. You know what I mean? There's not a whole lot happening. Um, and then, you know, having to combat um, the darkness, you know, seasonal affective, you know, disorder, like, um, you know, seasonal depression is like such a huge thing up here. Um, and so there's like all these environmental factors that we're, we're battling against. Like yesterday, I only we only had 12 hours of daylight up here, which for us, that was like, it's dwindling to the point where in the middle of winter, we're going to have, I think maybe five hours of daylight, something like that. And it's really, it's really, really depressing. Um, in regards to the political climate, um, luckily growing up, Pacific Islanders, uh, we've we've had a place here in Anchorage for a long time. Um, so that wasn't something that I really had to deal with too much, but I oftentimes don't feel comfortable driving, going to smaller cities outside of Anchorage um, because it does feel a lot more like Trump territory. Um, and you know, people just love their guns out here and all that, which to each their own, but it just, uh, you know, there's definitely that, uh, that feeling of discomfort. Um, that, that you had to recognize. And I think here in Arizona, like it's that there really aren't any Pacific Islanders out here. And if like the little that are, are so spread out, like there's no like enclaves, we're not like concentrated in one specific city or area. Um, so it just felt very like, I felt like the only representation I had growing up of being at least Pacific Islander was The Rock, which wasn't very helpful. Um, <laughs> uh, I think politically here in Arizona, um, it's the fact that it is conservative, except like around like Arizona State, it's more blue there. Um, 
and the heat kind of to the opposite point of Stanton being in Alaska. Um, so if, you know, like LGBTQ, especially youth uh, tend to be more like they're a big part of the unhoused community out here. Um, and then for like half the year, it's super hot. We just got out of like two really long, like I think month long um, heat waves of over 110 and our um, burn center was actually overfilled because people would fall on the sidewalk and get like a third degree burn. So it's, if these, you know, LGBTQ youth are houseless and they have to deal with that, they're dying of like heat exhaustion and stroke and like having all these issues. And then the, the Phoenix police is like a whole other story. But um, <laughs> so it's, it's tough to see um, what little Pacific Islander queer trans youth out here um, potentially dealing with that. Um, it's not something that I've thankfully had to deal with, but it, it's something I think about a lot when I do the community organizing work that I do to ensure that our youth don't get to that point and they have a support system, even if it's a small spread out one. Okay. The mute button was trying to fight me. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, to your point, I, I really uh, had been, you know, uh, curious about um, political climate. And you had brought up an equally good point about geography, right? Geography is also really important because we're talking about then, right, the disparity between urban and rural, right? Um, if you live in a place that's more rural, you're not going to get as many resources, right? It'll be really hard to access. And uh, and then also, right, like the, um, the, the different kind of environmental impacts on uh, mental health as well, depending on where you're at can cause different challenges. Um, and so, you know, in summary, like I'm, I'm thinking about all of the experiences that you all had shared and thank you for so um, generously giving your experiences to us. Um, I'm, I'm thinking especially about how both of you are working right to, uh, at that interface with um, Pacific Islander specifically, um, like Samoan and specific Islander communities. I'm wondering, you know, if there are recommendations or takeaways that you hope um, Pacific Islander or Samoan communities more specifically can do or learn to help um, LGBT folks, uh, especially thinking about LGBT youth. I can go first on this one. I have, I have a few points on this one. So, um... My first point I would say is to help um, help explore our own history because um, I didn't know anything about like Papa Fine Fatama, especially growing up in diaspora out here until I was older and I never saw it. Like no one in my family talked about it. That's just my family's experience, but helping within our Ainga, within the larger Samoan like history um, to let us see ourselves represented, maybe like mention family members who are part of the LGBTQ community, if there are any. Um, doing your best with language, again, speaking to being in the diaspora, um, not everything's gonna translate back and forth and that's okay. Like I think about me using they, them pronouns. My mom was having a really hard time wrapping her head around that and I get it because English isn't her first language. Um, and she's just doing the best of what she has. Um, and, it's, and it's also okay to get things wrong with those, with like all the terminology and things. Um, the terminology might be a little newer or like developed, but the concepts are still there and we can relate that back to our cultures, I think, and find common ground there. Um, and that it's definitely like, it can't like coming out or like talking to our families about these things can be really difficult and scary. Um, but at the same time, it's not always that serious. Like we're very like, you know, I, my Samoan family cracks jokes constantly. And I think like alleviating that stuff with humor um, can be helpful. So those are my takeaways. What about you, Stanton? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, I think my biggest thing that I think uh, Pacific Islanders um, 
can do to learn uh, to, you know, aid um, LGBTQ youth with our own community is to unlearn. I think um, there's been a lot of things that have been passed on to us that was not our original knowledge that was at the hands of colonization. And I think it just kind of seeped its way into our culture. Homophobia, transphobia, those were not things that existed in our culture until, you know, that contact was made. Um, so, you know, it takes a lot of uh, talking to elders, but we are all extensions of our elders. So talking to one another, uh, talking to the, to the children. Um, <laughs> and, you know, while doing so, it's about exercising patience, which can be extremely difficult because I will be honest, I'm not going to speak for all Pacific Islanders, but Samoans, stubborn. We are stubborn. Me, I'm right there with, I am, I am Samoan through and through. I am stubborn, but at least I recognize it. And it's something I actively work on, um, exercising patience within the community while trying to teach these lessons on how to, to better help um, our queer youth feel safe and understood, um, I think goes a long way. Awesome. Uh, those were super excellent takeaways. And I think that is going to be, um, you know, Takeaways that I, I I hope that uh, Pacific Islander and Samoan communities can really take to heart and really be able to listen. Um, equally as important, though, uh, as people in the community uh, are the people who are going to be helping them, right? And so for people who are, whether or not they are Pacific Islander or Samoan themselves, if they are providing mental health services and or substance use um, treatment to people within the uh, Samoan community or other Pacific Islander communities, what do you think are specific takeaways or things that you feel like they should know about serving um, specifically Pacific Islander LGBT folks? You better come off mute. Yeah, you come off mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, my main thing I was thinking about for this one is, and there's a fine line to this one, is encouraging bringing the culture and the family into the, you know, like kind of what you're talking about um, in session with Pacific Islander LGBT folks. Um, and I say that because uh, I, I've seen like my white friends talking about things like cutting off family and I think that that's important and it's valid and like it's something that we can do and it doesn't make us like feel belonging to do that um and I think at least for me in my experience it was hard to think about something like cutting off my family if they were not like okay with me or like not getting on the same page so um encouraging um those conversations with, with family and uh, looking to the culture, but then also making sure that you're not romanticizing um, Pacific Islander cultures with the, the people you're talking with. Um, we're not always the happy people. <laughs> like there's a lot of trauma and a generational trauma there. Um, yeah, like I said, there's it's a, it's a fine line, but I think it can be done. Uh, I um. I think this is a great question. I feel like it's such a loaded question. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know, are we help trying to help out youth that already know about themselves or trying to come out having issues with their families? Um, I think for me, um, you know, obviously it's maybe a little different to someone who's not a Pacific Islander, but I put a lot of focus on different areas of their life, not to distract, but um, I'm speaking specifically about youth who just knew that they, weren't ready to have that conversation with their family and just wanted to feel supported. Um, so oftentimes I worked the youth into volleyball um, where I was coaching. Um, I, got, I get to help out my pop sometimes with his girls team, but I also, um, they started a boys organization uh, for volleyball in Anchorage. And so I started to help out there um, and just making sure that the, the youth feel supported in some way, shape or form. Uh, you know, cause we can't always address issues head on, you know, as we know, this can be a very touchy subject for both the queer youth and for and for their family. Um, so there are other ways that we can support until it's time to find a different way, right? Um, but so once again, there, there comes that patience piece, right? <laughs> there comes, you know, making sure we're patient. Um, I think Samoan 
I think for outsiders, Pacific Islander culture in general can be very difficult to understand. It is very different. Um, when I went and lived on the East Coast in Boston and New York, having to explain our culture to people over there who had never met any sort of Pacific Islander in their life, it was like speaking a foreign language. Like they didn't know it, nothing. <laughs> they didn't know anything, you know? Uh, so I think that's my biggest piece of advice for any non-Islander trying to help out this youth is just understand that the culture may be different. Um, but you know just to have your intention and remember we just want these these queer youth to to feel safe to feel loved to feel heard um and you know try to be that resource for them thank you thank you uh and so yeah we've had uh, um you know uh, myself included a lot of learning from uh the experiences of you two thank you thank you again for sharing them for those of you who are um here attending now and will be watching this in the future, uh, know that this is not the uh, definitive end all be all for <laughs> Apagasi experiences who are within the beautiful Rainbow family. Um, these are just experiences of the two wonderful speakers. And, uh, you know, we, we hope that you are learning uh, a lot. I, I, I sure, I surely am. Um, and so, with that, if you have any uh, questions uh, in the audience, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat. We're gonna be moving towards kind of the Q and A portion of our programming um, to buy some time while people are cooking up some questions to be able to ask you all. One of the things that I, I wonder about is because, you know, I myself don't um, have the challenge of having to navigate bicultural spaces in the way that you two do, right? I don't have white family members and then like Samoan family members, or in my case, like Filipino family members and white family members, right? Like it's all one kind of culture. <laughs> and um, I did not have to do much navigating between these two families. For the two of you, you know, how, how was that experience of having to navigate between families or within, among all the other propositions of these families? I felt like, uh, I mean, you know, when when it's something you're born into, it's something that, you know, that's just like becomes a second nature. It was interesting growing up. I kind of felt like I had two different selves. Um, you know, my presentation to my white half and my presentation to my Samoan half were very different. Um, but, uh, you know, as I grew up and became you know, so confident and sure of who I was, it kind of merged into the same person. And I think that was kind of the funnest thing was watching the reaction of both my Samoan and my white family see different aspects of each side come out <laughs> for the first time. Um, but you know, <laughs> you, you can love me or hate me, but what you're gonna get is everything that I am, so. Yeah, I think for me, uh... Yeah, there were, I don't know. I feel like there was like that code switching that you talk about, Stanton. Um, and then at the same time, I just felt like I carried all of it wherever I went. Like, even if I tried to like, like I, would, like, I feel like I was never fluent in code switching and that little bits of the pieces I didn't want to show people would come out anyway. <laughs> um, so I think that made it an interesting experience because I, I remember growing up like wanting to always show my white friends like whenever I um, learned new words in Samoan, I would like try to tell them about it and like what it means. And then if I learned like a Siva, I would like want to show them and like put on like a little like show for them. <laughs> um, and I think for me, it, it was more with friends than with family um, because my dad's family um, didn't really like they weren't really around for us very much. So I did grow up like with my Samoan family. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, and then also people uh, guessing what I am ethnically. Um, like I remember being at a job, like I used to work at Arby's when I was younger and all my coworkers were like Greek, Persian, uh, Moroccan. And I was like, I, like I didn't even ask <laughs> they were just like guessing and like shoving it in my face so that's definitely a very unique experience I have to say <laughs> oh no oh no um I uh 
I definitely get that. And I'm, I'm on the, the receiving end on anybody's assumptions also, right? Like, I, I guess I appear ethnically ambiguous enough that you can kind of project, right, <laughs> whatever you think on me. Um, and to your point, sense, and I was, I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, uh, for any of you providers out there who are, are watching this, um, I think that's one of the, the things you want to avoid is acting on assumption, right? Like, just because they have explained to you that they identify as Samoan or half Samoan, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to all, everybody's going to identify the same way. And so I, I tend to think about it like um, when you come into a situation, you have these hypotheses right, about people, right? And you check okay, so rather than um, having this assumed as fact already about someone, maybe I can just check. And then if they say that it's not true and that it's not confirmed, let that also be okay <laughs> and not push. Are you really sure that you're not whatever I had put on you? Uh, be okay if you're wrong, that's fine. Move on <laughs> and learn like the actual accurate facts, right? Like. <laughs> I, I did want to highlight so we do have someone who has sent uh, in, the, in, in the chat here thank you for such a powerful dialogue within the many themes of this greater context I am excited to continue hearing listening and learning more thank you to you know I'm going to send her to sharing that with us um and let's see here it seems that uh in terms of questions, we don't have much more. So um, I wanna go ahead and uh, uh, thank you all for participating in this event. Um, for you uh, who are here in the Zoom space, Zoom space. I am pleased to invite you to participate in a post-event uh, online Qualtrics survey. There's a link to that survey in the chat here. Uh, remember, we don't have a like subscribe <laughs> that thing right here in the zoom chat and so the feedback that you're able to provide us will uh, allow us to make sure we increase the accessibility and awareness of asian american native hawaiian pacific islander mental health care services and eviction here in the u.s uh, and then it gives us a uh, a better idea of how to better serve communities across the nation. Uh, in addition, um, you will be able to enter a raffle for a $25 gift card for every event that you attend. So look at our calendar and see some that will be coming up. There will be one winner in every 10 participants or up to 10 participants. And so, uh, yeah, the more participants we get, the more chances uh, there are to be able to win. Um, the post-event survey takes about 15 to 20 minutes, and so with that time, you'll be uh, be bettering a lot of our future presentations and making sure that we continue to serve in ways that are helpful and uh, beneficial. So, um, yeah, I want to go ahead and give it to you, speakers, if you have any like uh, last words before we go ahead and adjourn our uh, presentation today. I just want, well, I did have one more thing that just popped up when you were talking, okay, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. when you were talking about like um, how some people may identify or not in certain ways. I uh, This is something that I should have touched on at the very beginning that there, there are a lot of half Samoans who don't like being called Afrikasi in, in the slightest, mm -hmm. um, which I find very interesting. I started to meet most of those when I was older, um, but I just that just like popped into my head. Sorry for not mentioning that sooner. I know that's kind of a random thing at the end, <laughs> but but there are some Samoans who are half, um, who are mixed, who just don't like being referred to that and prefer to just be called Samoan, um, which I get. Like like Leo had mentioned earlier, it's something that they're moving towards, you know, not really saying, oh, I'm Afrikasi, I'm, I'm Samoan. And it's it's something that um, aligns with me as well. Uh, but that was the last thing that I had, uh, that I wanted to say. And I just wanted to thank you and everyone um, for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, in uh, in the same vein of like circling back to points we didn't get to mention, um, I wanted to mention that um, in terms of like helping seeing where the work is to support Pacific Islander LGBT people, um, there was a a moment um, I think last year where my one of my aunties was like really dismissive of me trying to like gently inform her about the harm that like words or like off-color jokes can cause. Um, there was like a joke made about trans people that was very in very poor taste. Um, and that 
that moment where she kind of like dismissed it really hurt me personally but then also I can recognize that like like conversations like that and moments like that is where the work is um at least within our own families or within conversations we have with each other um and so I encourage people to um so long as it's safe to uh to be courageous in those moments especially with our Aina um to be like I said if you can if it's safe to like have those conversations and um say your piece even if it ends up not really going anywhere that's that's planting a seed um which can be helpful so uh same as Stanton Falte Terrava um thank you for having us both on here this was really great <laughs> thank you thank you all right and so with that we'll go ahead uh and uh, adjourn our webinar thank you to our attendees for being here and uh Aloha, paalam, until next time.